Yeah, so, uh, I asked some people are interested in the history of the University in Exile, so I wanted to give people sort of like a brief sort of history lesson um, to be very abbreviated, obviously, um, since I know everyone's busy and people only have limited time. But um, in 1933, the University in Exile was founded um, by then Director Johnson of the New School. And essentially, the political context. Um, in April, April 5th, the um, Nazi party had essentially issued a decree saying that all Jewish faculty members in Germany were going to be expelled from universities. When that happened, um, on April 6th, 1933, approximately 500 academics, Jewish uh, intellectuals, were essentially kicked out overnight from universities. Uh, it was at that point that Alan Johnson said, I'm going to be here, he had been meeting with the um, Rockefeller Foundation and the Committee to Aid. Um, German professors, and what they were hoping to do was to bring some of those German intellectuals here in the hopes to keep their academic scholarships and their work going, particularly political scientists, sociologists, and economics. And at that point, Johnson said, there's another great opportunity here at the New School, because of the New School's history and its legacy to sort of engage social science, to both be a, sort of a vessel for these academics to come over, but also to provide haven. And so in 1933, the first group of uh, academics came over, 11 men, one woman, um, all but one from Germany, one from Italy. Uh, they were social scientists, political scientists, economists, and sociologists. That initial court of the 12 made up the core faculty of what was called the University in Exile, which Johnson created essentially as a research institute. He wanted the new school, because of its role as sort of a critical arts, social science engagement uh, university. And I think it's in Europe to try to bring all those people together, both fleeing lots of persecution, but also because he viewed that is the role of the new school. And so from 1933 to 1934, approximately between one and 2,000 Jewish intellectuals fled from Germany, Austria, and other countries as the Nazis expanded. Of those, approximately 2,000 academics. <laughs> You had 178 which ended up getting positions at the new school, 30 of those specifically within uh, what we now call social research. At that time, it was called the graduate faculty. First, the university in exile with 12, and then expanded to 30 between 1933 and 1938. Sort of the second wave of intellectuals came over as Nazi you know, repression expanded. So between 1933 and 1944, about 2,000 academics who fled Germany, 178 of those found positions here at the new school and the graduate faculty or other programs. And that by far and large was uh, more than any other university in the entire United States. Now the one thing to keep in mind that's really important is most of these academics came from three primary <coughs> schools in Germany. And, um, Alvin Johnson knew many of them from his experience in the 20s when he was working on helping to edit uh, essentially a social science encyclopedia that would be a catalog of the sort of leading edge, best empirical research that was going on in Germany at that time. And so by bringing all of those intellectuals here and sort of setting that initial idea, what Johnson was hoping to do was to continue the musical's legacy as sort of the, the vibrant part in New York of originally adult education and now economic thinking, political science, sociology work, it was uh, challenging the sort of positivist trend that was going on in American academics at that time. That's the reason Charles Beard and others originally left Columbia and New York schools during World War I, partly because of protest politics, but also partly because of their concern about the sort of positivist turn in academics. I don't want to get too much into the theory of poli science sociology, but the important thing to remind people to remember is that because the new school was seen as this progressive school that A, was committed to social science, that engaged current contemporary political issues in society, it was seen as a natural home for these scholars in Germany who were studying problems with the Weimar Republic and what was going on, you know, how World War I and the imposition of burdens and repayments on Germany as well as internal problems were causing collapse in Germany and looking at that context and bringing that research and academic learning here to continue that sort of study. But also importantly at that point in time in 33 and 34 there still wasn't a sense that the problem in Germany wasn't just going to end. Even the Rockefeller Foundation 
in their own documents said like, well, let's just wait a little while, things will probably blow over. <laughs> Johnson was like, no, things aren't going to blow over. He saw the beginning with the Reichstag and others being a much larger trend and said, look, we don't bring these academics here to the school now. They may not be alive to later. So one of the things that was important about them coming here was at this point in US history, 1933, there was heavy persecution of Jews in this country, both through legal immigration and illegal um, political, social, civil acts. And so by the new school saying, look, we're committed to a modernist uh, social science ethic that has, particularly with these German scholars coming over, a social democratic leaning, very anti-fascist, and sympathetic to Jewish intellectuals, they said, look, this may be one of the only places in the entire country right now where you can come as a Jewish intellectual and not be persecuted where you're fleeing from the initial persecution. So why would a Jew want to leave Germany just to come here and be persecuted? He said, look, we can provide them with the ability to continue doing what they're doing, which is to be at the height of their academic career. You know, eventually, there's a whole long list of names that eventually come through, both the University in Exile and the graduate faculty, people like Leo Strauss being one of the more famous people referred to today, but there are a whole slew of different names in sociology and political science in economics that were setting sort of a new trend in how empirical social science was engaging current political issues in the 1930s, and particularly sort of creating a new idea of how economic, social, political policy had to be understood interlinked with each other. So very briefly, the idea was the University in Exile is the research institute for activist intellectuals. That's how Johnson thought of it. And for us, one of the reasons we chose the University in Exile as a concept or a name behind what we're trying to do here is we think the university needs to reclaim that legacy of activist, intellectual, engaged, empirical work. Because if we're not studying and learning and applying what we're learning, then we're sort of tied this bubble. So for us, part of what all of this movement is about is addressing you know, internal power structures, internal relationships. But for us, specifically right now, keeping in mind how the University in Exile is founding in 33 through 39 in particular, laid the foundation for the new school to be what it is today and a large part of why many of us are here because of that historical legacy. So in a very, very brief nutshell, that's a little bit about the University in Exile. There's two really good books. The other one I forgot to bring with me. This is one. It's a history of the actual new school. It was written by two professors. There's another one uh, called Refugee Intellectuals and it looks at Specifically, the influence and role of Jewish scholars, particularly in, econ in economics, political science, and sociology at that time. And just to remind people that a lot of us here are academics who are trying to continue that legacy of engaged political critique and learning, and that's what we hope the University in Exile continues to inspire here at the New School. Yeah.